Hello, welcome back to Intro to Cultural Anthropology with Dr. Angela Montague. Today we will be discussing the anthropology of politics and power. We have seen throughout this term how power is an essential dynamic of human relationships. You may recall that we defined power as the ability to bring about change through action or influence. In this sense, a change is, it, is any action that would not have occurred otherwise. So, as your professor, I have power. If you want to pass this class, you have to do the readings, participate in discussions, and study for exams. All things that you are unlikely to do on your own. Most colleges and universities also see to it that students have power. If I give you a failing grade on an exam, but you actually got the questions right, you can go to the school administrators and report me. Your school also has numerous student organizations and student government bodies that work with the administration to make changes in favor of student interests. Working to you, toward your degree is also a process of gaining power. Once you graduate from college, you'll have greater prestige and power in society. You will be able to apply for jobs for which you would not have been qualified for before, and hopefully you will have a higher earning potential compared to those who did not go to college. Power is inherent in virtually every human interaction, and thus it is inherent in our cultural systems. While we have talked about power many times in this class, politics is a new topic for us. From an anthropological perspective, the study of politics is the study of how we organize and regulate power. Political organization among human cultures is a diverse and fascinating subject of study. Um, we are not talking about studying political parties like the Democrats or the Republicans. Instead, we are looking at how social relationships are managed among hun hunter-gatherers, um, how a Polynesian chief maintains control over his populace, how individual human beings can affect the course of their government. Every act of power is either carried out within political systems or contrary to political systems. Thus, the anthropological study of power also includes the study of oppression and revolution. That is the ways in which we, we uh, negotiate our systems of power. We should also differentiate power from authority. Authority is the approved use of power, and it is generally based on personal characters. Uh, it could be honor, status, knowledge, ability, respect, um, or on the holding of formal public office, and it represents social approval. The chapter opens by describing the Arab Spring. Um, a series of protests and revolutions occurred throughout the Arab world in 2011. Protests began first in Tunisia after a man named Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire on the steps of a government building in protest. Uh, Bouazizi was a street vendor who sold produce, fruits, and vegetables in the capital city. Street vendors in Tunisia often faced harassment by local police officials, and vendors were often forced to pay bribes to the police just to sell their wares. After a lifetime of harassment, Boazizi was confronted by police on the morning of December 17, 2010. When he was unable to pay a bribe, he was harass harassed further by the police. His fruits and vegetables were knocked over into the street, and he may or may not have been slapped and spit upon by the police. Uh, witnesses disagree here. What definitely did happen, however, is that the police confiscated Boazizi's scales, which were an essential tool for him to sell his wares to customers. Boazizi went to the governor to protest and was turned away. He returned shortly thereafter with a can of gasoline, proceeded to dump the gasoline on himself, then lit himself on fire. He allegedly yelled out, "'How do you expect me to make a living?' Boazizi's act of defiance set off a wave of protests in Tunisia, which quickly spread to Egypt and then other Arab countries. By 2012, four governments had been overthrown by protesters, and many more still faced considerable threats from their people. The people of these Arab nations had had enough of military and quasi-military dictators. The resolution of the Arab Spring, however, has been considerably more complicated than its origins. While several repressive governments have been overthrown, the people are now faced with the struggle of creating new governments. The creation of political order is not simple or easy. 
It is easy to forget in the United States, but it took 11 years between the 1776 Declaration of Independence and the eventual adoption of the United States Constitution. Power and politics are among the most contentious topics in all human culture, and those who have power do not give it up easily. In this lecture, we are going to explore power as it is expressed through political systems and processes. The way humans have organized themselves in small groups, the role of the state in national and international politics, and the ability of people to engage in politics and exercise power through individual action and social movements outside the direct uh, control of the state. Um, we are going to examine the following questions in particular. How have anthropologists viewed the origins of human political history? What is the state? How is globalization affecting the state? What is the relationship among politics, the state, violence, and war? And how do people mobilize power outside of the state's control? How have anthropologists viewed the origins of human political history? In particular, beginning in the 1960s, anthropologists began to be increasingly interested in political structures. This interest was due in part to the political complexities involved in the end of the colonial era that followed the end of World War II. As old nation-states gave up their colonies and new nation-states emerged, the political process was more important than ever. It was also in the hands of many people who had never before been allowed to control their political organization. At this time, the specialized field of political anthropology began to take shape. Anthropologists working all around the globe began to focus their studies on political structures. These efforts resulted in numerous detailed ethnographies examining political structures from diverse cultures. These political structures range from simple to complex and from hierarchical to heterarchical. The incredible diversity of political structures found around the world made it pretty difficult for political anthropologists to communicate. Every political system seemed to be different, and thus comparison and cross-cultural research became cumbersome. In response to the overwhelming diversity of political structures, many political anthropologists began debating typologies, or systems of classification. Typologies of political organization today are among the most contentious topics in anthropology, Yet, these typologies have been among the most influential theories in our discipline. One of the most influential political typologies was that um, proposed by Elman Service. Service classified all political systems into just four types, bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and states. These types focused on a continuum of simple to complex, Bands had the least developed and least institutionalized political power structures, while states survived on fully entrenched bureaucratic systems. In services typology, the majority of modern nation states fell easily into the category of state. Many of the groups anthropologists had been studying fell into bands, tribes, or chiefdoms. Anthropologists also saw in these groups the origins and development of more complex political organization. Let's look more closely at services types. Bands make up services' smallest and simplest form of political organization. These groups are principally defined by several features, including small population size, ranging from around 20 people to several hundred, but no larger. They make use of foraging as a subsistence method. Social organization is primarily based on kinship ties. And social power structures are flexible and based on consensus. These structures are also highly egalitarian and are typically not dominated by any one person or group. Overall, the political structure of a band is primarily defined by its small size. As there are so few people in a band, there is no need for more intensive subsistence methods. Kinship, by default, has to be a primary organizer of people, as almost everyone in the band is going to be related to one another. Think back to your kinship uh, chart. How many people were on it? 20? 30? And the population base is simply too small to support an entrenched political power structure, in effect, full-time rulers. The flexible power structure of bands has been of great interest to anthropologists, it gives us the chance to ask if humans are egalitarian or hierarchical by nature. As we've seen, 
The majority of humans have lived as foragers. This means a majority of human beings have lived in egalitarian social structures. But in today's world, with very few exceptions, virtually all humans live in cultures that include notable political hierarchies. In any political hierarchy, there are more people on the lower tiers than there are on the upper tiers. Take your typical monarchy. One king or queen oversees tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of subjects. There are always more people who could rise up and physically overthrow a power structure than there are people controlling that power structure. While occasional revolutions are not uncommon, a majority of the world continues to live with hierarchical political structures. Even in modern United States, which prides itself on being an open democracy, we have a notable political hierarchy. If you doubt this, ask yourself if you could make an appointment to meet with the president of the nation. Then ask if the CEO of General Electric or or Bank of America could make an appointment to meet with the president. While a majority of human beings have lived in egalitarian societies, a majority of humans today are willing to live in hierarchical societies. We may never have an answer as to what is natural for human beings, but it seems as if we are quite willing to accept both types of the structures. The next step in services typology is the tribe. Tribes are principally defined by a relatively small population of a few hundred people up to a few thousand at most, larger than a band, but still pretty small. Subsistence is based on simple forms of pastoralism and horticulture. With more mouths to feed, you need feed, you need more, uh, a more productive subsistence system. In some cases, where you have a particularly productive environment, tribes may still rely on foraging. Social organization is based on villages and kin groups, including clans and lineages. At this point, we have more people than just a kinship group can encompass. Thus, people start to identify with their village or place of residence. Power structures are uh, still relatively egalitarian and consensus-based. Some leaders may emerge, but power is limited and based on achieved status, i.e. that person's personal achievements. Some... uh, Something to keep in mind is that tribe and tribes can be a problematic term in anthropology due to its other meanings and popular um, discourse. For example, news reporters often use the term in a pejorative sense, attempting to convey a sense of primitive or uncivilized people, uh, so that when violence breaks out in remote parts of the world, reporters immediately jump on ideas of tribal factions or ancient tribal hatreds. This usage of the term tribe is very much at odds with the use of the term in anthropology. Anthropologists are solely referring to the structure of political organization within the group. They are not making value-laden statements about the worth of the culture or its politics. If you make, the, uh, make use of the term tribe in this class or in an anthropology class, make sure you are very careful about using it correctly. The Tuareg are considered an ethnic group. Um, They are from the Saharan regions of Algeria, Libya, Mali, and Niger. Being nomadic, they traditionally moved across national borders, and small groups of Tuareg also live in northern Burkina Faso, um, Mauritania. There's a small community in northern Nigeria. Um, Although they are considered an ethnic group, their name is an outsider term, and most call themselves Keltomashek, which means those who speak Tomashek, which is a Libeo berber language. Um, They may also call themselves Keltagelmust, which is people of the veil. You can see in the picture on this slide um, of a man wearing the traditional um, indigo veil. Um, They also call themselves Kel-Azawad, which means people of Azawad, and this is their indigenous name for the areas they traditionally inhabit in the Sahara. So, at the turn of the 19th century, the Tuareg territory was organized into confederations, and each was ruled by a supreme chief called an amenical, along with a council of elders from each village or tribe. And this is where it gets pretty complicated. These confederations are sometimes called drum groups after the amenical symbol of authority, which is a drum. Um, Clan, or Tusit elders called emegaran, or wise men, are chosen to assist the chief of the confederation. 
Historically, there are seven major confederations. Now, consultants in my fieldwork in West Africa generally used the French term tribu, which means pretty much tribe. It doesn't maybe carry the same connotations as the word tribe in English, um, and this is how they describe their Tusit. When asked to clarify what one consultant meant by tribu, he said it was a faction of the larger group of Tuareg um, in northern Mali. From what I could gather, it had some features in common with tribe in the anthropological sense, meaning that the faction that I worked with, the Kel Ansar, consider themselves to be descended from a common ancestor. But it might be more appropriately defined as extended family. Baz Lecoq uses the term clan, which he translates from the Tamashek word to sit, um, which he describes as, quote, quasi-kin groups based on a lineage ideology which varies per clan. The point is, they are a pastoralist group um, that have both features of a tribe um, as well as a chiefdom, having an amenical who is a uh, chief. So, bottom line, it's complicated. The next most complex form of organization in services typology was identified as the chiefdom. Chiefdoms mark a significant change in human organization to a more complex form of organization. Chiefdoms are often regarded as a transitional form eventually leading toward a state. Chiefdoms are principally defined by the following characteristics. Populations at this point become much larger, organizing thousands if not tens of thousands of people. As a result, chiefdoms also typically organize multiple villages or population centers together. Subsistence methods employed by chiefdoms must be more productive in order to provide for all of these people. We typically see the emergence of agriculture in these groups. Remember, we defined agriculture as the intensive production of domestic plants by means of irrigation systems, terraces, raised fields, or other means. Agriculture produces a substantially larger food base and thus can feed the dense population of a chiefdom. Populations and chiefdoms are organized around the consolidated political power structure, i.e. they're organized around the chief and his or her seat of power. Thus, we often find that the chief's home village is larger than other villages in the region. Other villages tend to be smaller, with a greater reliance on kinship organization. The uh, political power structures found in chiefdoms represent a major shift toward hereditary and hierarchical power. To be a chief of a chiefdom, you have to be born into that role. Typically, no one gets to work their way up to being a chief. The political power of a chiefdom, however, is not as stable as a state. We've already mentioned the possibility of revolutions within modern nation-states, but such revolutions of power are even more common in chiefdoms. One chiefdom will rise in power over a few decades, only to eventually collapse and be replaced by another growing chiefdom. Archaeologist David G. Anderson coined the term chiefly cycling for just such a phenomenon that he found in the archaeological record of Mississippian chiefdoms. Putting typologies in perspective, services typology has been both widely embraced and widely criticized by his fellow anthropologists. The most prominent critique has been that services typology oversimplifies the reality. This is undeniably true. We are boiling down every single culture that has ever existed on the planet into just four types. By this point, you should have a new appreciation for just how diverse culture can be. Thus, you can imagine that no single culture would ever perfectly fit into any one of services types. However, services typology is also widely employed by anthropologists. Those who deny they use services typology are generally working from data shaped by our understanding of this typology. The great strength of services for types is the fact that it gives us a vocabulary to discuss cross-cultural differences. When scholars don't make use of a shared vocabulary system, chaos is generally the result. People talk past one another and retread ground already well studied by someone else. Imagine if every computer used its own unique programming language. They would never be able to efficiently talk to one another. 
Services typology can unwittingly encourage us to overlook nuances of different uh, difference between cultures, but it also allows us to talk about the differences between cultures. As I will discuss briefly concerning the Tuareg, it often cannot capture the complexity of different indigenous organizational structures, um, especially when those cultures begin using the terms but in different ways. Um, but it still is a useful way to discuss their structure. What is the state? So we've saved the most complex of services types for last. This is the state. As we will see, the concept of state has many meanings of its own. Let's look at some of the defining traits of a state in terms of services typology. States typically have populations in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. In the modern world, the only upper limit to state growth is the amount of food that it can grow. In terms of subsistence, states at the very least need to employ a strong form of agriculture. All states make use of some form of agricultural intensification, whether it is fertilization, irrigation, what have you. In the modern world, most states have begun making use of industrialized agriculture in order to feed their populations. Social organization within a state is generally removed from kinship. When we were looking at bands, kinship was the primary form of organization. But in a state society, there are numerous other forces that organize people's lives. These may include nationalism, city or local consciousness, ethnic groups, and so on. They could be essentially any concept that you can think of that would serve as a primary organizing force in people's lives. We should not, however, completely ignore kinship. As each of you know, even in a modern state, kinship can still be a powerful influence on one's life. Finally, in services description of a state, political power is firmly entrenched and bureaucratized. This is a notion that political power has, in a sense, gained a life of its own. The death of a chief could mark the destruction of an entire chiefdom. But the ruler of a state is less critical to the survival of the state overall. The political institutions that run the state will continue carrying out their work, even if something happens to the head of state. Service also emphasized the monopoly on power that a state could maintain. States are capable of organizing standing armies as well as conducting massive construction projects. Chiefdoms and other groups do not have the lasting and entrenched power to allow them to undertake such endeavors. Let's step away from services view of the state and look at the nature of states in the modern world. Our definition of a state is an autonomous regional structure of political, economic, and military rule. These states are organized by a central government with ability to make laws and use force to maintain order. The primary difference between this conception of a state and services conception lies in the territoriality. Service was primarily concerned about the structure and function of the political system. Geographical territory was a secondary interest to him. However, to the modern-day residents of states, the territory of the state often becomes synonymous with the state. We erect barriers, monuments, walls, etc., all out of a deeply held desire to define state boundaries, even in the case of friendly states. Um, I recommend this uh, video you can watch on YouTube called Canada and the United States, Bizarre Borders. Um, anthropologists are particularly interested in the ways in which states are constructed and maintained. While each state is unique in its ethnic composition, territorial resources and cultural history, states as a concept of political structure share a notable amount of uniformity. Generally speaking, this is much more so than is seen among chiefdoms. As we saw in our discussion of nationalism, concepts of state and nation are constantly in the act of being created and reified. So can you think of ways in which the United States or your home country is continuous, continuously creating its identity? Think about national holidays, the use of nationalist imagery, um, such as like Uncle Sam or Rosie the Riveter in the U.S. Um, also sport and competition, the Olympics are a, a great example. Foreign relations, uh, the sharing of origin myths, etc. Anthropologists have also found that states always attempt to establish a monopoly on power and force. 
Many modern states have standing armies, and virtually all have government-backed police forces. The use of force outside of these institutions is typically illegal or closely controlled and monitored. Political power, i.e., the power to make laws and control the population, is also tightly controlled. Non-governmental bodies are typically restricted from making their own rules and regulations. The state also frequently makes use of hegemonic power, i.e., the power to create consent and agreement within a population without the use or threat of force. We've talked about hegemony before. This is essentially the power to shape the way people think. Hegemony is used by the state to establish what should be normal behavior. In the end, states are primarily about control. They are such effective controlling bodies that many of their citizens think of them as natural entities rather than cultural constructions. How is globalization affecting the state? The increasing trends of globalization have had a significant effect on states around the world. At a bare minimum, globalization has brought states into increased contact with one another. This increased contact is largely responsible for the increase in nationalism witnessed over the last century. People need a way to recognize themselves as distinct from each other. But increased contact and nationalism is far from the only effect globalization has had on states. Non-state actors, however, are not exclusively looking for profit or to carry out acts of violence. In recent decades, civil society organizations, also known as non-governmental organizations or NGOs, have become increasingly common and influential. Civil society organizations are typically activist organizations. They are seeking to raise awareness about issues such as indigenous rights, the plight of the hungry, or the spread of diseases like HIV-AIDS. Taking advantage of the resources made available by globalization, specifically easy travel and communication, these groups work on an international stage. Particularly prominent organizations include Amnesty International, Doctors Without Borders, and Human Rights Watch. Together, these organizations have become powerful forces of advocacy around the globe. The good intentions of NGOs and civil society organizations, however, often run up against the very complicated reality of modern cultural identity, national identity, and the struggle over political power. The Maasai people represent a traditional cultural group in the African nation of Tanzania. The Maasai have largely avoided modernization and integration within the nation-state. Instead, they have maintained their traditional cultural values, along with traditional pastoral economic practices. Because they have not integrated within modern nation-state, the Maasai often face discrimination and other problems in maintaining their lifestyle. For example, as pastoralists, the Maasai require large open territory for animal grazing. Yet, Tanzanian state officials viewed this land as empty and unused, thus they started to sell the land to private investors. In an attempt to protect their way of life, Maasai group members formed several NGOs in an attempt to raise international awareness of the plight. In entering the world of NGOs, the Maasai chose to ally themselves with other indigenous rights campaigns. Indigenous rights groups focus on promoting and protecting cultural groups that are indigenous to a region, and yet their survival is threatened by colonialism or its legacies. Thus, Native Americans are a good example of an indigenous group. The ancestors of Native Americans lived throughout the Americas, yet even today they have been marginalized and pushed off of their traditional lands by European colonists. Tanzanian state officials, however, objected to the presentation of the Maasai as an indigenous group. This characterization cast the Tanzanian government in the role of colonizer. While Tanzania was a former European colonial state, it is now controlled by Africans, who are just as indigenous to the continent as the Maasai. The Maasai, however, gained sympathy on the international market for their cause and successfully raised millions of dollars. Unfortunately, once the money was raised, local groups felt it infighting over how it should be used. NGOs have had a powerful effect on the modern world and undoubtedly have good intentions. However, the transnational globalized world carries numerous local cultural complications that are difficult to fully anticipate or work with. If we are going to talk about politics and power, we have to talk about violence. 
What is the relation among politics, the state, violence, and war? Political groups, regardless of their level of complexity, have frequently involved themselves in violent confrontations. People living in everything from bands to states have had to deal with violence. In today's world, we seem to be living among a perpetual outbreak of violence. Somewhere around the globe, there is always an ongoing conflict. As a result, it is understandable to ask, are humans naturally violent or peaceful? With such widespread violence around the world, it is tempting to suggest that there must be something in human nature that predisposes us to violence. Arguments around this question tend to fall into three generalizations. Humans are indeed naturally violent. It must be some form of instinct acquired on our evolutionary trajectory. Humans are not violent, but the violence arises through cultural practices that overwhelm our natural instincts. The roots of violent behavior lie somewhere between nature and culture. That is, both nature and culture influence our behaviors. Primatologist Franz de Waal has sought to come to a better understanding of the issue of violence among humans by studying violence among our closest relatives. DeWall has worked with a variety of primates, including chimpanzees and bonobos, both of which are great apes and thus closely related to humans. He has also worked with macaques, a species of old world monkey. He has observed that primates are inherently social creatures. While conflicts do break out from time to time, they have more to lose than gain by maintaining a state of perpetual violence. They need the socialization that a group provides, thus they will work to maintain that group. Overall, overall, DeWolf witnessed numerous forms of reconciliation among primates. These were acts specifically meant to reassure group members after a conflict broke out. From DeWolf's work, we can summarize that conflict ex- itself may be inevitable. When large groups of individuals live together, there will necessarily be conflicts over different interests or limited resources. As primates, we need social networks to be happy and healthy. Thus, we will inevitably seek ways to end conflicts and reestablish social order. Warfare is an intrinsically different act from interpersonal violence. We can imagine genetic origins for violence in terms of a personal conflict over immediate resources, that is, the heat of the moment. If someone steals your food, you might need to become violent so that you can retrieve that food and survive to the next day. But warfare is a planned act, something that involves the calculated action of thousands of people. It thus does not remotely compare to a spur-of-the-moment unplanned action of anger. The maintenance of a state of war requires specific planning both logistically and culturally. A population has to be willing to maintain a war. The concept of militarization refers to the preparation of a society for an ongoing state of warfare. This preparation involves not only the production of the objects of war, i.e. weapons such as guns, bullets, tanks, planes, and so on, but also the creation of consent among the population for undertaking a war. The creation of consent is a hegemonic power. You must encourage people to glorify a state of warfare, to believe that it is worth sending people away to die on the front lines. To be effective, a state of militarization must employ both of these strategies, the production of the objects of war and the creation of consent. Many sociologists and anthropologists have expressed concerns about the creation of militarized societies. Once a society has been militarized, it creates patterns of thought that affect everything around them. Fields of scientific research, such as physics, information technology, and psychology, all can become bent toward improving military capacity and consent. Citizens also become increasingly convinced that violence can be used to solve all problems. There's also a strong tendency to dehumanize enemies, thus encouraging us to think of them as different and less than ourselves. So, how do people mobilize power outside the state's control? So far, we have been focusing on how states control power. If you recall, we opened this chapter talking about the revolutions against state powers that have become known as the Arab Spring. States are not all-powerful, and they can fail either due to the actions of another state, for example, Nazi Germany successfully absorbed several neighboring states before it was eventually overthrown itself by other states, 
or states may be overthrown by the people who live in them. The Arab Spring caused the governments of four states to be overthrown. In this last section, we're going to look at some of the ways in which people can access power outside of the state's control, or how individual people can influence the state. James Scott's book, Weapons of the Weak, has become a widely cited example of how the powerless can resist the powerful. Scott was studying a small rice farming village in northwestern Malaysia. In the 1970s and 1980s, the region experienced rapid economic growth. As a result, most of the farming lands were bought up by rich farmers or corporations. In many cases, local farmers had their land stolen out from underneath them. As an economic lower class, the local farmers quickly found themselves forced to take the few low-paying jobs the new farm owners would offer. Scott observed that the local Malaysians were reluctant to publicly speak out against their disenfranchisement. Instead, they made their objections in more subtle ways, in which they could not be specifically blamed for speaking out against the new farmers. Uh, Scott documented several strategies of resistance, which he termed the weapons of the weak. These strategies included foot dragging, that is, people moving slowly to comply with requests. Slowdowns, where people would go about doing a task at a slower rate than it could be accomplished. False compliance with regulations, where locals would deliberately act against regulations but claim ignorance or misunderstanding when they were found out. In addition, Scott witnessed outright thefts, sabotage, trickery, and arson. Have you, or has anyone you know, ever made use of the weapons of the week? What about when you didn't want to do a homework assignment? Do you think that the weapons of the week may have contributed to the racial prejudices that Europeans held about colonized populations? Social movements form another way in which people may gain influence against the power of the state. Generally, most social movements do not seek to overthrow a state, but instead they seek to influence its behavior. These movements typically form around subjects of intense interest to the citizens of a state. These subjects are considered so important that people feel they simply cannot remain silent. There are numerous examples of successful social movements from around the world, but for now we'll look at just two such examples. One, rural social movements. Costa Rica has long been one of the most stable and prosperous countries in Central America. Yet in the 1980s, Costa Rica was gradually drawn into the civil wars of its neighbors and was also hit by a growing economic crisis in Latin America. As Costa Rica had long served as an ally to the United States, America offered to help in the country's time of need. The United States sent, sent large quantities of subsidized corn, wheat, and rice to Costa Rica to help feed those in need. While U.S. imports did help to feed many people, they also effectively drove Costa Rican farmers out of business. Those farmers who were still growing crops in Costa Rica found themselves undersold again and again by the subsidized, mass-imported U.S. foodstuffs. Eventually, a majority of Costa Rica's small farmers were driven out of business. At the same time, Costa Rica had sought monetary assistance from the IMF and the World Bank. These organizations agreed to assist Costa Rica, but only if they cut all subsidies to local farmers and got rid of all tariffs against foreign goods as well as ceased to supply government-backed loans and reduced investments in education and health care. You remember um, from a previous lecture, structural adjustments. The country agreed to the loan as it was in desperate need for cash, but the Costa Rican people soon found themselves without any government support and living in a country that was still in debt to foreign nations. Costa Rican farmers rebelled. They marched in the streets, blocked highways, and held demonstrations. Ultimately, they occupied government buildings in protest. Through this persistent public campaign, the people won concessions from the Costa Rican government. The government promised, promised to reinstate access to government loans. Ultimately, the Costa Rican farmers could not undo the damage that they had suffered, but they succeeded in making their plight heard and providing an outlet for future hope of a recovery. If we are going to discuss social movements in the modern world, we cannot ignore the worldwide impact of the Occupy Wall Street movement. The Occupy Wall Street movement began in September of 2011 when protesters occupied Zuccotti Park near Wall Street in New York City. 
They were there to protest the financial inequalities found throughout the United States, but most notably the inequalities that had been exacerbated by the 2008 financial collapse caused by reckless speculative investments made by investment bankers. In the movement's view, the people of the United States had paid for these mistakes, but the bankers had not. The Occupy movement's success, success was felt most viscerally through the use of social media by its members. These newfound forms of communication allowed for rapid organization, not only in Zuccotti Park, but in the spreading protests around the country. In a matter of days, similar sit-in protests were being staged in major and minor cities all across the United States. Within a week, protests were being staged in cities all around the globe. This kind of worldwide organization by a small-scale social movement had never been possible before. The Occupy movement was truly a movement of the new globalized internet age. Ultimately, the Occupy protesters received few concessions from government officials, but they did draw attention to rampant economic inequalities within the modern world. In particular, they popularized the phrase, we are the 99%. The phrase originated around the fact that the majority of the nation's wealth is actually controlled by just 1% of the population. As we discussed in our chapter on class and inequality, many Americans had been unaware of the vast disparity in wealth and income within the United States. Such economic disparity runs contrary to the national origin myths. Thus, people have been prone to overlooking this economic imbalance and its necessary correlation with the power and influence held by 1% of the population in a democratic political system. The Occupy protests gradually dispersed, but the movement continues in many online communities. Finally, we have an example of people seeking out a source of legal power outside of the state, Islamic Fatwa Councils in Cairo, Egypt. The Fatwa Council of Egypt was established as far back as 1935 and has long been an established authority on Islamic religion. At the council, Disputes are heard and judgments, including possible punishments and rewards, are given. The Fatwa Council is an extrajudicial body, as compared to the personal status courts operated by the Egyptian state. That is, it has no legal authority in the nation. Yet, it has tremendous moral and religious authority. Religious authority in the modern world is typically not controlled by the state. If we look further back in time, this was not always the case. European monarchs ruled by divine authority. Egyptian pharaohs were considered to be explicitly divine. The kings of the ancient Maya were both political and religious figureheads. Modern political structures rarely exhibit this kind of integration. There are many ways this arrangement could be interpreted. We have seen the states have an overriding interest in total control. The fact that states have generally lost control over religion suggests that perhaps people are not fully comfortable with a solitary source of power in their lives. As we have seen in this lecture, power and political structure are complicated topics in cultures around the world. Democracy is far from the only successful political structure on this planet. We are likely to see continued struggle for power between states, within states, and by non-state entities for many decades to come. This brings us to the end of the lecture. Be sure that you are comfortable answering all of these questions. How have anthropologists viewed the origins of human political history? What is the state? How is globalization affecting the state? What is the relationship among politics, the state, violence, and war? How do people mobilize power outside of the state's control?